afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the kickoff uh, panel to the New York City People's Tech Assemblies. My name is John Catt. I'm the Director of Technology Development and Data here at the Office of the Public Advocate, and I'm really excited and honored to be working on this project in partnership with many organizations, both here in New York City and, and around our state and country to really emphasize the importance of involving community and their voice, especially when we design and implement technology solutions in, in the name of service of our constituents. Um, with that, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet and I'm gonna turn it over to Noel Hidalgo, the executive director to kick us off. Great. Thank you uh, and welcome to the kickoff event for the People's Tech uh, Assemblies. Um, let's see if I can get our slides going here. So uh, if you were around eight years ago um, and, and were one of the meetups, uh, uh, attended one of the meetups in, in the five boroughs, um, you helped contribute not only to the city's understanding of what the future tech agenda uh, would have been, but you helped establish a baseline of what Beta NYC has worked on over the last eight years. And um, over the last eight years, we've been really focused on how do we build a community or a civic organization that builds up uh, uh, our opportunity through civic technology, through data and uh, uh, design. Uh, and our work has primarily focused on achieving digital literacy, uh, and focused on open data for all. Uh, our community eight years ago sat in series of rooms all across the five boroughs and outlined and identified what were the problems that they were experiencing and what were the potential solutions. And when we had these conversations, we really wanted to focus on what were the explicit things individuals were facing we wanted to understand what you as the New Yorker had difficulty uh, achieving or what you wanted to see our city become. And that led to the creation of the People's Roadmap for a digital New York City. And for us, it has been about making sure that you as New Yorkers understand the digital tools that are at your doorstep that can help you achieve your life, education, economic opportunities, transportation, et cetera. So from that, we ground ourselves in four core freedoms, the freedom to connect, the freedom to learn, the freedom to innovate, and the freedom to collaborate. And through uh, our work, we have actually built a, a, a comprehensive program at Beta NYC you're seeing images from our Civic Innovation Fellows, which we have employed with the Manhattan Borough President's Office to help support community boards and civic organizations over the last uh, six years. Um, we're well, actually, we're on our way to having the eighth year. Um, and so now uh, we want to revisit what are all the components of the People's Roadmap, and we also want to examine other roadmaps and other policy documents that community organizations like Cornell Tech have produced. Um, and we want to help come together and really uh, uh, validate these ideas and have a conversation on what the next eight years look like. Um, and so today we're gathered with some really amazing New Yorkers uh, Jumani Williams, who's the New York City public advocate, Gail Brewer, who's the Manhattan Borough President, and also the Ferry Godmother for Open Data, Lucian Reynolds, who's the Manhattan Community Board uh, One District Manager, and Sandy Nurse, founder of BK Rot and the co-founder of the Mayday Space and a Carpenter. And together, we're going to do a bit of an introduction. We're going to ask them to say their names, their pronouns, what role they engage in civic society, and some ideas on how technology has evolved for them um, and what is their definition of community. So with that, Jumani. Uh, thank you, Noel. Uh, peace and blessings, love and light uh, to everyone. Thank you for being here. And obviously it's an amazing panel. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jumani Williams. Uh, I'm the public advocate of the city of New York, commonly known as a watchdog agency over uh, New York's agencies and uh, the, the mayor and the city government as a whole. 
Uh, there's clearly areas of both city and state operations that can be using technologies in a more equitable and inclusive ways. Uh, and we've seen that highlighted throughout this pandemic uh, from all over the place. The biggest one that most people saw immediately was uh, with education. I'm a community organizer by training. And sometimes I think about uh, technology being helpful even back then as a housing organizer. I even think about have, having had the uh, the uh, worst landlord list uh, that we do out of the office now. Even back then, we were an organizer and the technology used to gather all of those, that piece of information and being able to have it in one place. Even as a political organizer, you know, when you think of something like uh, people don't know the common name of Van, but those of us who run uh, know Van very well, being able to have and access things uh, that are needed for people to either move an issue or, or move in, in politics is, 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 uh, is amazing how far we've come. Uh, technology has evolved. Uh, it's integrated at an amazing pace. Uh, the use of technology within government in the service of our community uh, has been no different. However, one area that has been seemingly diverged from the norm in government's use of technology is the relentless focus on those it needs to serve. Uh, as technology continues to drive government services, it needs to continually be centered on those it implements to serve. Uh, that's why the Public Advocates Office is striving to learn all the time how Kissing students are being served in New York City, what changes uh, need to be made. Uh, and one tool that we have here uh, is COPIC, uh, which my office chairs uh, and presents an opportunity to better connect the government to the people, whether through improving public hearings or expanding accessibility of government resources. Having a fully funded COPIC is vital to ensuring the privacy and security of public data and has an independent and transparent voice. And thanks to John and even working with people like uh, you, Noel, we're really trying to push COPIC out there in a way um, that hasn't been done uh, in quite some time. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity here. I know we're trying to do this quick and dirty, so I'll end there. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Thank you very much, Noel. I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, she, her. And the way I look at this issue, which is, as you suggested, the role of civic, the role of community, the role of technology, I come at it um, maybe similar to the community boards uh, and what Lucian is doing. And certainly um, big support of COPIC for many years. When it first started, I was there. And I want to thank uh, Sandy Nurse also for her work and Beta NYC. I would say that the government has to be responsive to the public. Now, that sounds to me like what is strange isn't that what government is supposed to do. I can't tell you how many times government is not responsive to the public, whether it is on the, in the housing, in the job, in the health care, in the education, as a public advocate indicated. And that's what has to change. Um, I must admit, the reason I got into government in the first place and ran for office was to make these agencies, I think there are around 80 city agencies, be responsive. And it's a challenge every single day. They are siloed. They don't necessarily talk to each other. And maybe technology can help. And that's why I'm here. Um, I remember when we did, and thank you for mentioning it, pass the open data bill when I was in the city council, the end of the um, time that I was there. And it took us quite some time, but guess what was interesting? When we passed the open data bill, guess who was most supportive? The agencies that didn't know what databases they had and didn't know what other agency databases existed. And so now here we are um, some years later and to the credit of Beta NYC and others, at least people know that what other agencies have in terms of a database and they know from the public what has to be updated, what's real time, what's useful, what's not. And there's a constant reevaluation of open data. So that's one example. The other one I want to mention is during this god awful pandemic, I think we learned that community can be defined differently. Um, nobody really had to use technology to talk in meetings on a constant basis, maybe some of the large corporations overseas, but not on a community level. Whether it is the school board, the community board, the Solid Waste Advisory Board and all the other boards that I sit on or you sit on, we learned that many more people participate with Zoom. But guess what happens? There's an open meeting law that says you cannot pass resolutions as a government body if you're not in person. There's no such thing as a hybrid meeting. And so we have to get the government to catch up with reality. And that's another example. The other example that I get from uh, some African-American women doctors, friends of mine, is telemedicine. Because who got hurt during this pandemic technologically? Obviously, we can talk about many sectors, seniors and youth. 
You heard about the students, no devices, no internet, all the challenges of learning. But the seniors also got hurt because they didn't know what was going on. They don't know how to use technology. And these doctors are telling me that telemedicine could change people's lives, but we're not necessarily there. So I go right back to what I said earlier, which is how can, as a community and civic government, use technology to improve people's lives and how can government play a role? So government has a long way to go to get to that point, but I think that's what we're all about today. And I want to say, um, even though we're talking about one-stop shopping for businesses and uh, you know, you can get a job online and all this, you still need to have a very different approach to using the technology so that you're not siloed, so that people are talking to each other, and so that people in the community have the same speed, low cost um, aspect of technology with the hardware and the software and tons of training to go with it. We don't have that yet. So that's why I'm here and I want to congratulate you and thank you. Great. Thank you. Lucian. Lucian, you're muted. Hi, everyone. Let's try again. I'm Lucian Reynolds, he, him. I'm the district manager of Manhattan Community Board 1. Uh, many of you may be familiar with community boards, but uh, a little bit more uh, information about district managers. We're in the city charter as a mandated position, and we're in charge of service delivery and quality of life. Um, way that boils down to how I see uh, our community uh, in District 1 is really anyone who lives in District 1, anyone works in District 1, studies, uh, passes through, uses any kind of service. Um, these are all parts of the community in District 1. And that's really important to make sure that it's extremely inclusive because I rely on anyone who's within the borders of District 1 to help improve quality of life and service delivery for everyone. So if someone's uh, passing through and they're changing trains in Fulton Street and they notice that there's a leak uh, and they call that into me, I make sure the MTA is aware and we could prevent a real service issue for anyone who starts or ends their journey on Fulton Street. So it really is a, a, a much uh, a larger idea of community uh, in terms of making sure that the city functions well. Um, in terms of technology, I would say the best piece of technology that um, has happened uh, in the last eight years is uh, uh, AI transcription. We've always been recording our meetings. Uh, as long as I've been the dis a district manager and when I was on the community board in East Harlem, meetings were always recorded. Um, but to be able to get the, the, the value out of those recordings would take an additional four hours. If it was a four hour meeting, you'd have to sit through four hours to really get an idea of what was discussed. But with AI transcription, you know, you put it in, 30 minutes later, you have an idea of what people said, you can search through, and it's really been a sea change in understanding and really mining the most critical information out of hours and hours and hours of community meetings that happen. So uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy with that service. Great, thank you. And to Sandy. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sandy Nurse and my background is I'm a community organizer. Um, I'm the founder of a youth jobs program called BK Rod. I'm the founder of a grassroots organizing space called Mayday Space, both located here in Bushwick, uh, Brooklyn. Um, I am a street activist or a direct action organizer. I'm a carpenter. And um, my new role will be uh, hopefully uh, incoming city council member in the 2022 cohort that's coming in. Um, and so I guess I'm coming from a very different perspective uh, as a grassroots organizer and someone who's um, been on the outside of City Hall. My uh, experience with tech is mostly about how to make tools and use tools um, that are popular and accessible to people to um, both activate space. So you, um, explaining and making use of different databases on what types of land or buildings are owned by the public that uh, people can access and how do they start to figure out who's the right person to call, what's going on with that space, is there potential for the community to start to use it. Um, there have been a lot of different tools made around mapping, um, gentrification mapping, um, tools that allow people to understand if they have a rent stabilized building or to understand the context of their housing um, as it relates to uh, more housing justice movements 
Um, and also playing around with different ways to create more accessibility. Um, through our project at Mayday Space, we had explored what does it look like to be part of the NYC mesh network? How do we um, extend these types of um, creative projects that actually create uh, accessibility for folks? And then playing around with some of these tools during um, crises that are happening in the city. So for example, during this last year, people were using tools to track needs around how to get mutual aid to different community groups. So I come from a place of using and making tools that don't exist by the city, that can't move faster um, than city agencies, but that people are developing in real time based on specific needs and situations. And uh, I'm really interested in this conversation about how can there be lessons learned around both of those two for the city to be able to to better move um, and be flexible and responsive to things happening on the ground and, and to really interact with that kind of natural energy that happens when people are responding at the street level, at the neighborhood level. So I'm really excited to be here and thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you all for being here. I love the perspective that we, that we have on this panel. I mean, I'm gonna just, before I do this, can we bring up one slide? Um, for those of you who are watching uh, via the various social streams, um, I want you to know that you can ask questions. I have the window up here uh, via this tool called Slido. So sl sli.do forward slash uh, PTA dash AUG23. Um, and um, you, walk, you log into this website tool and you can ask the question and I will uh, see it right here on my computer screen. Um, and I'm going to close my stop screen. Thank you. Um, and what I love about the diversity of this panel is that we, we're really running the, the, the whole spectrum of not only making sure government operations are uh, accountable and that they're effective, but that they're working for the 21st century that we can be talking about ideas and, and frameworks for whether it's health or economic opportunity through telemedicine or one-stop shop for businesses. Um, and then we talk about actually getting people the support and, and the access that they need um, and making sure that when we look at the future, which isn't too far away, right? We are, we are in 2021, we're almost smack dab uh, a quarter of the century through um, uh, how do we make government uh, agile and responsive to the increasing demands and, and crises that we are facing? Um, and so uh, this panel is now going to walk through uh, three different sections. We're going to talk about technology. We're going to talk about designing government services. And then we're going to end up on managing the future. Uh, and how do we, how do we get uh, through all of the different systems uh, thinking that we're, we're trying to achieve here? Uh, so first, uh, to all the panelists, um, feel free to just pop your, your hand up and, and respond. But what technology came out in the last eight years that you can now no longer live without? That is like the thing that you check on the daily basis. Um, so who would like to answer that one first? <laughs> yeah, all right. Jumani, yes, sir. Uh, I just figured I'd go because nobody, I think we were all trying to figure it out. <laughs> but um, I don't know, you know, how many years things have, have popped up, but I do have to check my social media. I think everybody probably here is addicted, uh, addicted to it, um, your social media. And the ease of which you can get everything on your phone, it's kind of like you're walking around with a computer. Um, and I saw somebody say once, it's so bad, um, you know, it's a little crude, but when you wake up in the morning, you're either checking your phone before you go to the bathroom or while you're in the bathroom. It's just one, it's one or the other. Uh, so uh, pretty bad. And I would say to what um, you know, the Paul president said, you know, I don't think we would have known how important Zoom was. I'm like, these kind of platforms existed beforehand, but I think it's hard to it's gonna be hard to go back completely without using this form in some way or the other for meetings. And and I think the Bar President is correct. We have to you know, kind of not update the open meetings law and what that means in terms of accessibility uh, for people uh, to be able to access the government while understanding some people still don't have the access needed even in that platform. Thank you. 
I concur with that. <laughs> I can't even imagine another thing that I need essentially. Um, I think that kind of covers a lot of it. Um, I think having email on our phones, I wish we didn't have it. I wish somebody didn't invent that, but they did. And now we have it and we can't go back. And there's no excuse for us not to be working all the time. So, um, you know, hopefully as we move forward developing tools, we don't, you know, we don't create more hurdles for ourselves and more work for ourselves. Um, but yeah, I concur with what the public advocate said. So I agree. I have to say, I think that we're still slow. Yes, we all check email. We all look at social media, but um, there's just a whole lot of people who aren't doing that in terms of using it for something that's for the greater good. And that's what's frustrating. In other words, how do we take the open data and make it more uh, accessible? I know we're trying. And how do we take, when I go to Washington Heights and I go to the small stores, they do not have an online presence. They do not have the tools except for the ones we just listed. You can't run a business today without many more tools than currently are just used for the individual. They got to have a much more robust, some of the ones that Sandy suggested or the ones that Lucian has suggested. We're not there yet. And, I, and that's why I get very frustrated by, yes, we can all do our social media, we can all do our email, but how does that help the small business or the senior with her telemedicine or the list goes on? Or I still, I don't know what's going to happen September when the schools open. Please tell me what is going to happen, right? I mean, are those teachers trained? The kids don't have the devices. I'm at every school all summer long, as I'm sure you are. Those devices are not in the hands of the students. So, um, so I, I think I'm, I, you know, when I when you say technology, I must just, I must admit I associate it with frustration, and so I, I'm just expressing that um, not personally, but my experience in the community has not been great using it for the benefit of those who need it the most. Gail, is there one tool that that has evolved as like your go-to tech tool to to? Um, be an elected official? Oh, I mean, I do the same thing everybody that uh, the public advocate and Sandy Nurse mentioned. I mean, I am, um, but it's very, uh, you know, we try to get information out, but then I, okay, so we have a great newsletter. We have a great website. We tell people about jobs and art organizations and so on. I don't know who's reading it. Is it the same 24,000 people who already have all of this information? Great point. So then I get frustrated. Uh, then I get frustrated. Uh, Lucian. Well, I, I'll have to echo what the, the public advocate said about uh, Zoom. I, I know I mentioned uh, uh, AI transcription, and that's been huge. Um, but you know, we all have to stay in awe of the sea change that um, remote meetings has, has brought on and what it's allowed. I'm not sure what they did during the Spanish flu uh, for productivity, uh, but um, certainly, you know, there's only one answer uh, during this modern pandemic, and the only way to be connected is to is replicate being in person together um, to whatever extent that that it's necessary. And for for meetings, um, you know, having everybody's faces in a room um, gets you in about 80% there, and that's enough. You know, that's close enough for jazz uh, for for for. Uh, discussing things, uh, d deliberating, passing resolutions, uh, and being transparent and, and inclusive. And just one one word on inclusivity. Um, there's a there's a, a pairing between accessibility and inclusivity that we have to make sure that we're we're adhering to. And, and just because someone can log on doesn't mean that they feel like they they should be logging on, be part of the conversation. Um, and and that goes also to what Gail was saying about the. the uh, and, and Sandy, the digital divide uh, of, of, of technology for the elderly and the youth, making sure there's access. Um, but that also goes uh, for um, the homeless as well. Um, how do we make sure that people who are in our district who have no homes are present in our meetings if there's no physical space for them to attend? Um, you know, on one hand, we saw a huge surge in people who, um, for time constraints or distance constraints, were never able to go to our meetings. But then overnight, it seems like they were able to attend, whether it's because they had kids or they worked late or they worked too far away from home to get back on time. It made meetings possible for them. Um, 
But even if we embrace those changes well into the future, we're still going to need to provide some way um, for, for people to be able to be included in these conversations um, if they are fully remote for any reason. Well, uh, you, the four of you have pretty much touched on all of the other questions that I wanted to talk about technology. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to very quickly say, um, well, you know, like this is a forcing function for us to engage. Um, you know, how have you uh, stayed in touch with your communities that are on the other side of the digital divide, specifically asking them how to improve the government services that were being rendered or that were not being rendered? Um, so, um, Sandy, I would love for you for you to take this one first on like how how have you how did you develop a ground game to engage with uh, your your neighbors and support them during these crises? Yeah, I mean, I think it was offline and it was um, you know very analog, <laughs> which works for me very well. But it's really you know the the folks that live in the communities that are within my political geographical boundary. Um, lots of them are not online. They can't afford a monthly internet bill. Um, there's not enough um, digital or information technology literacy to even know how to utilize uh, these things. And then also there's a language barrier. So um, a lot of the stuff we did in terms of just getting uh, information about food distribution was really reliant on pre-existing um, person-to-person -person social networks that already existed and that were already really strong and had a lot of trust in them or people doing, you know, paper flyers and letting folks know that something was happening somewhere and being consistent in time and place so that people knew to come back even if there was not an ability to communicate with them in between. Um, and then just in terms of, um, you know, some of the bigger challenges we saw in terms of like small businesses, a lot of small businesses, for example, didn't know how to get the PPP. They don't have, you know, some of them didn't have um, email accounts to register with. Uh, they didn't speak English. Some of these platforms were not in uh, multiple languages that allowed them to figure out what the steps are, steps one through six to get access or to even get registered in a system. Um, some people don't have you know, don't have documentation who are running small businesses. And so who can apply for these things is challenging. And the main thing is that, you know, a lot of folks really needed a, a, a human being facilitating these processes with them that our current, the way our public services and goods, particularly public benefits or public assistance programs are more heavily being administered um, are not allowing for. So the ability to, you know, go online and, and sign up for um, unemployment insurance, a lot of people wanted to talk, do it on the phone and they're waiting hours and hours and they don't have a computer and they don't have Wi-Fi at home. So they don't, they're not, they're stuck. And you have people five, six months out who've never gotten a public assistance check because they've just never even gotten registered. And so to me, the reality is although this was a very unique situation, the reality is we have to be building the human powered systems that are um, corresponding with the city rollout and city services. And, and I do think that the, the city should spend um, some money to study how, how, these, how people were accessing um, goods and services and support um, during this time when in-person wasn't allowed, the phones were, you know, wait times were forever, we, and the staffing of these phone services was not good enough, and people just didn't have access to online services. And these services are also these online um, spaces where people might go to access the internet to apply for things are not secure, um, and they're putting their sensitive information in. So there's a lot that needs to be looked at and pulled out from the lessons learned of just how vulnerable these digital systems are in terms of meeting the needs of people in crisis moving forward. Thank you for that. Um, and I think it's so unique that, that we have uh, Madam President at, who helped find COPIC and, and, the, and the public advocate who is running COPIC. So, um, which is like the, the, the commission that's supposed to be focused on public information and communication. Um, uh, specifically uh, to the um, 
public advocate. Um, how do you plan on on gathering? Like, what is your ideal version of gathering uh, feedback from the public to improve uh, services? Like, how how are you thinking about using this campaign uh, through the People's Tech Assemblies uh, to get people's voices to ultimately make change inside of government service delivery? Well, one, you know, thanks to uh, John Cat on my on my team and folks like you, uh, we really think we can get Copic uh, up and really doing something uh, that hopefully uh, will last past one, uh, two meetings and last past uh, one public advocate. That will be a, a step in the in a very good direction. Uh, but you know, to to the to what we've been talking about, right? You were trying to get. Uh, information and feedback often from communities that don't have the access to the technology uh, that we're trying to get information about. Um, I think um, we're trying to do these listening assemblies uh, on, well, obviously on technology now, but what we've been able to do in the public advocates office is, you know, kind of, I, I tried to come with the community organizer uh, mind frame. And so we really expanded our community uh, engagement um, uh, unit. And so we have borough advocates and we have issue based uh, deputy public advocate. And that was helpful because, as uh, you know, Sandy was saying, a lot of this stuff at first has to be analog. And so during the pandemic, well, one, we were actually about to launch some great uh, free spaces we were going to have in every borough uh, to provide some access, but COVID hit and we had to shut some of that down. But, uh, but we were and still are very much in touch with. Um, in each of the issue areas, in each of the boroughs, we're in touch with people who are doing work on the ground. So for people who have technology and people who don't. And what we do is we allow that to guide us in the direction that we're gonna go. And so we were able to find out who didn't have uh, the laptops that are needed, who didn't have um, the food they needed, who didn't have access to sign up to the, for the vaccines. And so we were able to get information in real time uh, and respond as a government agency to do that. But what we need to do is find out what's happening and why folks are not having access to technology, even if they need it. Even if you have um, the laptop, you may not have um, the service to use a laptop. Um, and we have to, I think what's happened often is people forget that government probably is, has access and is holding more data than any other corporate or entity. And I think government forgets that. So it's, it takes its time to try to hold corporate entities uh, responsible, but not itself responsible to the privacy of that data and that information, but also allowing people to be able to access that information in a user friendly way. We saw that happen even with the rollout of um, the vaccines and people trying to get to the vaccines. We see that happening with the Excelsior Pass. So uh, oftentimes we're not talking to the community about what they would need and how they can best access uh, the information they're getting, we kind of just set up a thing from on top uh, and expect people to just get it. And time and time again, that fails. And so what we do very much here uh, is try to work from the bottom up uh, from the community. But what is it that you actually need and how best can we get that information to you? Uh, what technologies will be able to help uh, to do that? Uh, and even, I would say this is about technology. So we have to push uh, to get the best technology to the most amount of people but we also have to be able to understand that sometimes we, we may need to uh, still be on the ground and, and talk to folks to get the information to the grandma who may not have access to it in the way uh, we think it's easiest to get to her. Did that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it actually helps me segue uh, over to the borough president in, in the role of task forces. Um, you know, like as we're talking about improving government services, uh, um, the borough president's office has invited me to be on a number of different task forces. Uh, I, Gail, I would love for you to just talk about like, how do you, how have you leveraged those uh, ad hoc uh, and kind of um, meetings to funnel feedback and to make the, the concrete change or to make modifications to the, the crisis environment that we've been in? Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I think the one that's a couple of them, one, uh, Jamani Williams and I were involved with construction safety. Um, I hope that it made a difference, but we spent like a whole year working with the industry, trying to 
figure out why in hell's name people die on construction sites. So that wasn't one that had a tech front, except for the fact that um, probably uh, the Department of Buildings doesn't have, to be honest with you, I hope the legislation that mandated more safety officers on every construction site. But again, I don't know that the DOB has the right kind of technology to make sure that these sites are safe, union and non-union. So that was one example where tech probably could have played a much bigger role. And I hope in the future, God, nobody dies on construction sites and we find a way. More recently, um, we have had a really successful one on small business. And coming out of that with uh, owners of buildings, uh, small businesses, uh, day laborers who are employed, um, every kind of small uh you know, liquor stores, everything you can imagine, and including the community boards was were involved. And what came out of it was a couple of things. First of all, um, obviously a bill that is now pending before the city council with council member Rosenthal. And it does include something, obviously it has to do with leases and some of those challenges that know only too well. But one of the reasons that people do not get uh, PPP is not only do you not have technology, but guess what? You don't have record keeping. You don't have accounting services. And that's the first thing they need to show all of that data. So one of the mandates is that the city, small business services, I'm always going back to government, should darn well for free for uh, small businesses provide that kind of information so that they can get whatever the federal government has. And that came out of the task force. The other thing that came out of the task force, no surprise to you, is um, figuring out how one stop would work. Now, of course, every elected official, Damani and I heard it, and Sandy and Lucian, everybody running for mayor said, one stop, one stop. For business. Well, you know how many years I've heard one stop? So what exactly is one stop and how can technology use this? Just as an example, when we talk about having the public realms are, 25 city and state agencies work in the streets. You hear about DOT, you hear about DOB, you hear about the MTA. There are 25 agencies working on the streets. So I guess, again, how can they work together using uh, technology if that's what it's going to take? But that's another example. And what came out of the task force was one stop, and this is how it would work. Now, exactly, you know, it needs uh, refinement, I'm sure. But that was another part that has been discussed endlessly. The part that I didn't hear, which I would like to hear more of, is evaluation. Because, for instance, in East Harlem, where there is an active bid, um, very grassroots related, they managed to get you know tons of money to the small businesses. They worked with the hospital, developers, money, and so on, so that they were able to survive and feed people and keep going. But, and they managed to get some Instagrams and maybe some other social media. There's no evaluation. Did this work? Did this not work? What would work? And I think that's one of the aspects that I hope going forward, you know, how to improve government services. When you have a service, how do you evaluate it? We never evaluate it, in my opinion, not with people who are actually uh, evaluators. So that would be another aspect of all of this. When we get services in the neighborhoods that you think make sense, be it telemedicine. Just the other day, I was with, um, we have a senior task force. And what do they want? Technology, so they can see their grandchildren. We always hear that. But one of the issues was they don't know how to use it. So I went to a senior center in Harlem last week. Oh my goodness, I didn't know where they, they were like packed. I'm sure it wasn't legal COVID wise, how many seniors are in there. Why were they there? Because some smart senior director had brought in a high school and college kids. And each senior had a high school college kid working with them on their cell phone. Oh my goodness, right? Um, I, I was like, are you sure this is legal? Because um, there was no room to move in the room. But, you know, that's the kind of thing we need to have much more of that so that people can feel that A, government is working for them, but B, there are services that actually make people's lives better. I keep going back to the government not doing that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but we need the feedback. We need to have services like the ones I mentioned for the small businesses and then for people where there is something real that you can take away. People have to see and, uh, you know, we're all on Zoom, but in person also, they have to see that something is improving their lives. I must admit, I still have something called an envelope and a mail. If I really want people to show up, I send a mailing and everybody laughs at me. But uh, I remember when we were doing the Inwood Task Force, 
And you know how Udonis is, you know, Udonis Rodriguez, he's in charge and he's doing this and that. Well, he didn't have too many people at a meeting. So I'm like, where are the people? So I didn't tell HBD or, or the council member, but I sent out a, me, a, a mail and 800 people showed up. They didn't have chairs, but I made my point. You know, at this time and age, you still have to do what Sandy was talking about, which is the flyers at NYCHA and the mailing in different languages if you really want people to show up. And then you have to do the follow-up. So technology is great, but we're not there yet in terms of actually doing the outreach. I was so proud of that meeting. I can't tell you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, hopefully my network connection um, uh, isn't crapping out right now. Um, but uh, Lucian, uh, there's a question from the audience that is specifically asking, uh, did Zoom or digital feedback increase or decrease the divide on who participates in community meetings? Lucian, you're muted. Thanks. I think it's a mixed bag. Um, I think that um, typically community board meetings, um, the, the people that we we see most consistently are those who um, uh, either uh, have jobs that are flexible enough to allow them to leave uh, with enough time to get to the meeting, um, or they are uh, they don't have children, or they perhaps are retired, and um, the the way that the pandemic scrambled that to some degree was um, all those who weren't able to access the meetings um, started attending uh, when there were things that interested them. Um, but also there's a detriment to um, to those who were on the wrong side of the digital divide. So um, we saw a lot of challenges for those who um, didn't have smartphones uh, or didn't have reliable computers. Um, some people had computers but couldn't troubleshoot certain issues with a browser plugin needing to you know fire up the the, the remote meeting software. So you know they had to have special, considerations taken for, you know, direct mailing them links. Um, some people only joined via telephone. Um, and if even if the open meeting law reform were to pass and it required your camera to be on, you know, they still wouldn't be able to contribute to quorum if they can't move from their telephone to, um, you know, having a more uh, involved presence in the meeting. Um, so there, there are certainly uh, different levels of access, of, of reduced access. Uh, for people who had uh, uh, barriers to technology, whether it was experience or um, the possession of, of technology. Um, you know, in the very beginning, we spent hours and hours and hours troubleshooting, training our members. We didn't just throw links to our members and say, this is what we're doing now. Um, we spent hours on the phone uh, helping members figure out their, their own setups, uh, running them through test meetings. Um, and, and how to turn their screens on and turn the screens off and mics and unmuting, unmuting, and I'm the one with the unmuting problem in, the, in this meeting. So, uh, <laughs> um, but that, that's necessary. And without the training, um, people will fail. We can't expect, we can't expect success without enormous amounts of training. Um, and that's something that we're gonna have to keep doing to keep bringing um, new generations of people into the fold um, that, that, you know, I, I could definitely see you know, the need for computer labs and having people sit down. Um, you look at, you know, the Apple computer model, they they have people sit down for one-on-ones to learn how to use it. And that's not any different from uh, what we have to do here in New York City. Uh, the good thing is, is that once you teach people, um, they, they get it. I mean, this is pretty intuitive stuff. Once you get over that that hurdle of, of, uh, of, of mistrusting your own skills and ability to grasp it. But to, 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 to do it is to believe uh, that they can do it. And uh, and if they bring their own tech in, their own cell phone, and we download the app for them, and we set it up, and we let them click through it a couple times, they're good to go. Um, so that's going to be a, a really important part of what we do in the future. I, I assume that as more people are able to come to our office, we'll, we'll be getting walk-ins with people asking us to set up their cell phone or their tablet. Um, you know, just like uh, Gail has been doing community training sessions for all sorts of things from land use to conflicts of interest, I can definitely see a future where a borough president's office sets up computers and has people learn how to sign into Zoom meetings. Um, but that's, you know, that's something that we have to plan for. 
Uh, Noel, can I just say something about that question? Yeah. Because I think it's important. And I think, as was hinted to, it, it was a mixed bag. I think it helped. But like most things with this, with this pandemic, it really highlighted the digital divide that was already there uh, in some extent magnify it. So I think it's great that you are able to have, um, say, an app ability to go remote schooling. But when you see who was hit the hardest was the people who were always hit the hardest. And so the real thing is when you put new things uh, into a system that already has this problem, if you don't put it into the system, acknowledging and, and already preparing to try to deal with that imbalance, you're going to have the problems that you have. So someone should have went in thinking about, okay, some people may not have the computers. Some people may not have the computers, may have the computers, but they may not have the internet and the and the technology to get on. That should have already been thought. And the same things with the, the vaccines, trying to get it online is a great idea. But who was thinking about the people who are going to have trouble uh, getting online and navigating it? And so that's, you know, sometimes part of the problem. You come up with the great ideas and designs, but no one's in there thinking about, well, how is it going to impact folks on the ground and the people who need it the most? But we put some mechanisms in there to adjust and deal with the problems that had been there for, for a long time already. I'm also wondering about this. You know, we always talk about municipal Wi-Fi for free. And supposedly the NYCHA developments are getting, I've met with some of the providers. I'm sure they're in other boroughs also, but there's an RFP. They've been responded to. But, you know, one uh, company doesn't know what the other company is doing, just FYI, in terms of the developments. Um, but I'd like to know, you know, more about what it is that is going to be uh, successfully implemented. And then I want to know for the rest of the city, you know, we keep talking about this notion of municipal Wi-Fi. It never seems to pull off. Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? What exactly is NYCHA getting? Uh, for the work that's being done, et cetera. So I think that still needs to be for the future, some of the discussions that we're trying to pull off. Well, we are almost running out of time, um, but I wanna give Sandy an opportunity to just talk about uh, uh, NYC Mesh, because I think that that's one of the solutions that we have here inside of the borough president's office. Um, and I'd love to hear how, how it was being utilized out in, in Bushwick to help address some of these digital divides. So yeah, I'm probably the worst person to talk about the details of NYC Mesh, but um, you know, I, as a grassroots institution, Mayday Space really wanted to try to be part of the infrastructure that extends Mesh to wherever it goes. And I'm sorry if I'm not explaining it right, but you know, we try to put it on our building so that some you know people around us we become a node for it. Um, and I think that these types of um, projects and creative uh, opportunities to put the technology and the infrastructure that's super low cost into the hands of people um, who can then extend it to where it needs to go is, is certainly the way to go. But I, I am of the opinion that whatever you invest in a digital um, technology, you have to over invest in the human capacity to deliver it. Um, train people, implement it, execute it, and sustain it. Um, and, I, and just to echo what Lucian said, like the amount of times and repetition that you're going to have to do that um, can't be underscored enough because people learn these things differently. Um, and they're, and it, until we're at a place where this is like a common curriculum in schools and the schools are keeping up and adapting the curriculum fast enough, and we're also capturing older adults who... Um, also need to learn these things. We're just not going to get there where we're actually effectively maximizing the potential of these tools. Um, so I do think that, you know, we we wanted to do that. We've been using Verizon files for years, but we wanted to be a part of as a community institution, ex extending that infrastructure. And I think it's something that more public, you know, public buildings should have NYC mesh on their on their buildings and be able to be a part of a node um, that allows more people to tap into it, but then even communicating to people that it exists, how can they use it? What does it mean for the information they're putting online? Should they be putting their social security on it? Is it secure? Um, all of those are questions that people may have and reasons why people may not choose to interact with that technology. So again, I just, I really feel that as much as we are 
um, investing in these things or investing with popular technology and allowing people to play with it, we have to build in the, the human one-on-one -on -one space where there's constant ability to learn how to make use of it um, for whatever, whether it's community board, Zoom meetings, um, whether it's, uh, you know, schools, like even though know, people talk about, you know, the, the laptops they use, but I don't know if anyone's seen those school laptops. They're so old and archaic. No one ever wants to use them. Um, or whether it's things like the um, Link NYC nodes where you can go plug in your things. Like people need to know how to use it and what it means to put their information into these things so that they are informed on, on what could happen. Um, so yeah, just really emphasizing the, the need for a more human capacity in, in the rollout of these things. And of course, beforehand, before they're even rolled out, making sure there's enough input on how it can be used and whether or not it's even a useful thing to be investing in based on whether people think it's something they will, will spend time with. And, and just one more aspect of that role for the future is the E-rate. You know, I tried, but it was not successful to get the FCC to say that uh, schools and libraries, all of which have E-rate, could be a node for the community and it could go outside the wall so we're not hanging out the library and trying to get, you know, uh, whatever uh, Wi-Fi we can get. So again, that's another, uh, my understanding is the FCC is looking at that now. I could be wrong, but that would be another place to put some of these discussions. Um, well, with that, uh, thank you, Madam Borough President. Thank you, Public Advocate Williams. Thank you, Carpenter Community Organizer Sandy Nurse. Thank you, District Manager Lucian Reynolds. Um, this has been a really amazing panel, and thank you for helping us kick off our uh, People's Tech Assemblies. And what I find most fascinating about this conversation is that we never uttered the words human-centered design, yet we just spent uh, roughly 45 minutes focused on making government focused on the human-centered. Um, and so through our next two months, uh, we would love to have you back to continue talking about how government services uh, should be more human-centered and how they use technology and data uh, intertwined. And for those of you who ask questions on Slido, I really, really appreciate it. Sarah, I'm gonna make sure that your question gets uh, answered in regards to how closed captioning and speech uh, for text transcription for public meetings has been used or how it should be utilized. Uh, for questions around small business, we definitely are gonna be hosting a, a, a uh, people's tech assembly around small businesses. We'll, we'll host one uh, around internet access uh, and connectivity. Um, and to really um, explain how the people's tech assemblies are gonna be uh, unfurling themselves over the next two uh, months. Um, I'm gonna hand this off uh, to Kate Nicholson, but in the meantime, uh, I will let's all give a virtual round of applause to these panelists. Thank you, um, all of you, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, and we will see you around the office or in Zoom uh, or in One Center Street. And Kate, I'm gonna hand this off to you now. Great, Great. thanks Noel. Um, awesome to be with everyone today. Uh, so yeah, like Noel said, um, we're trying to engage people in as many possible ways as possible. Um, and considering um, the use of considering the use of technology we are using technology to engage more people um so we uh everyone can see my slide correct i think so yeah great um so one of the ways that uh one of the things we're testing out is um a platform for engaging residents uh, so we can hear more voices at a deeper level and um actually make use of their input in uh, government decision making and planning so, um, you know, one of the issues that many people have with local government is that voices get lost in the decision making processes. And so there's a need for more secure and transparent ways for people to participate. Um, so we're hoping that by testing this out and by having you help us test it out and provide feedback along the way, uh, we can create more processes for people to input on um, decisions being made and the future of the city. So um, the platform we're using is called Citizen Lab. Um, and we've um, created a uh, site uh, at NYC nyc.citizenlab.co. So uh, if you log on there and uh, you can help us test it out. So um, you can, once you arrive at the, at the landing page, um, there's a way to sign up. 
You can also participate without signing up. Um, we appreciate you signing up and sharing a little bit about who you are. Um, all information is kept anonymous. Um, we wanna know who we're hearing from because one of the issues is people get lost along the way. And uh, in order to understand what communities we're not reaching, we need to know which communities we are reaching. Um, so click sign up and then um, that's on the landing page. Uh, when you scroll down, you can see different projects that we're using to engage uh, folks in. So one of the projects is a People's Tech Assemblies survey. Um, the survey is um, asking questions about uh, general sort of basic questions that we can sort of gouge folks um, opinions and perspectives and experience with technology and New York City government. Um, and so I'm just gonna show you that really quickly. Uh, when you go to the survey, um, you are taken to a description about it. Um, you scroll down and you can take the survey directly in the website. Um, and now I'm gonna scroll back up and take us back to the homepage. Um, and we're gonna check out the assemblies. So the assemblies are sort of the main event. Um, we're gonna have both virtual assemblies and um, analog ones. The virtual ones will take place and make use of a sort of uh, workshop um, workshop software that is enabled through this platform. Um, but we recognize that not everyone wants to get, use technology to facilitate conversations. And uh, there's also gonna be ways for people to participate um, in events where we're, you know, we're using sticky notes, putting them on the wall and um, gathering input that way. So um, the People's Tech Assemblies project is where you can learn all about um, upcoming events um, and where you can, uh, you can view the event schedule and soon you're gonna be able to access other resources. So if you wanna host a public tech assembly, or sorry, People's Tech Assembly in um, your community, you can uh, find tools and resources to do that here. Um, so you can see, for instance, this event schedule shows today's event and a future event um, on National Day of Civic Hacking uh, around reimagining 911 and public safety. Um, so I mentioned the workshop um, software. Uh, there's, it's an interesting and neat way to engage folks. And one of the things that we like about it is that it allows for us to collect what you have to say and um, use it as an actual input. So once we conduct the workshop, we can then say, okay, this is what everybody said, we're gonna now take that and synthesize it and turn it into input that we can use to inform um, planning processes and uh, decisions being made. Um, so now let's go back to the homepage. Um, back on the homepage, you can stay in touch with our updates and future projects. We have one future project coming up that's going to be a way for people to participate in an ongoing basis so you can, um, you'll be able to join the project and then uh, just sort of respond to prompts and have discussions and um, discourse in an ongoing basis. Um, so we are very interested in hearing from you. Um, we hope that you'll take a se second to explore uh, the platform. Um, and the three sort of things that we hope you take away from this uh, short demo is uh, we would love for you to register and start using it and take the survey. And we would love for you to sign up to attend assemblies as the schedule um, launches. And if you're interested in hosting your own assembly, we're looking for people to join us um, as partners and as facilitators at events. Um, we have a whole bunch of exciting events coming up that will soon be uh, available for you to check out on the, um, on the platform. So. Uh, a few different ways to get in touch. Uh, Noel, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Hope that was quick enough. Thank you. I'm gonna actually close us out here. And I just wanna say a quick thank you to everyone who joined us today for our launch panel to discover the ways in which our office, the Public Advocates Office and the many partners that are coming alongside us to emphasize the importance of centering all of our constituents in the design and implementation of our government services and how it uses technology and technology and data. Uh, great panel, really, as, as Kate was saying, we would love for you to join the conversation online on the Citizen Lab platform, but also be stay tuned at the advocate.nyc.gov, beta NYC, hashtag people's tech um, for the upcoming listening sessions that we're gonna be hosting uh, to, to share your voice, share your narratives and your, your ideas. So again, thank you all for joining us and we will see you in the future.